Thank you so much, and thank you to my son, Neil. <laughs> and my other sons, they did a good job. I'm so happy to see all of you here today. Longtime friends, new friends, and people who are thinking about the same thing as, as helping people with ALS. But my job today is to introduce our speaker. And I just want you to know that I have introduced Hugh McCall before. And it was really easy because I just said, Hugh McCall needs no introduction. <laughs> However, don't come up yet. <laughs> this time, I would like to say a, just a few things about Hugh, Joe Martin, and the Joe Martin ALS Foundation. I'll be quick because I know you really want to hear Hugh. When Joe was first told that he had ALS, he told Hugh about the diagnosis. Then Joe went home to do some research on where he could get the best care. Before he had come to the conclusion that Dr. Appel in Houston was the best, Hugh called Joe to tell him that Dr. Appel in Houston was the best. <laughs> of course, that is before our Charlotte ALS clinic was begun. And now we think Dr. Brooks is the best. <laughs> so Hugh and Joe were on the same page for 12 years of ALS. While Joe was living, he wanted to help families with ALS. He started the process, what is now become the Joe Martin ALS Foundation. The idea to carry on Joe's dream was told to me by Neil Cottrell and Rusty McDonald, who were Joe's assistants for many years. I was amazed that they wanted to continue working with ALS. But a 501c3 was acquired and we were ready to go, but how? We didn't know what was next, so I called Hugh and told him we were ready to begin, but we needed some guidance. He said he was coming right over to my house, so I called Neil and Rusty and said, get right over to my house. That was a memorable moment, as Hugh asked us all kinds of questions, see if we had done our homework, and then he offered to get us going for the first three months. And we moved on from there, as you all know. So let me just say, Hugh McCall really needs no introduction. Here's Hugh. Well, uh, I should say thank you for that introduction, but, but I don't have that in my mind. <laughs> Tonight I've been given an impossible assignment, and that is to talk about our friend Joe Martin and keeping it light and keeping it brief. Now how does one talk briefly about a man who meant so much to so many and who accomplished so many things? Sorry. After reflecting on this for at least a month, I decided to tell his story through a series of other stories. Now let me begin by saying Joe was my friend, my advisor, my critic, and my inspiration. I don't remember when we met, nor how he came to work for NCNB. I do remember why he quit, and how we got back together, <laughs> and that's my first story. <laughs> I had sort of a habit that when I had a meeting in our war room, Anyone could offer any opinion they wanted, and we didn't care what right they had, but we valued the opinion on the opinion itself, on the value of what they had to say. So long story short, we'd had a big important meeting in which Joe was there, but did not speak up. And he came down to my office and uh, told me his opinion about what had been decided. And I must have told him that I didn't give a damn what his opinion was. <laughs> because if he did not, did not offer it in the war room, it didn't matter to me. 
<laughs> he went to Chuck then and told him, you know, I'm leaving. Uh, he doesn't like, doesn't want me, doesn't need me, and so he left. <laughs> he has a different version of that, but <laughs> he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> now, I needed him very badly and wanted him back, and for about two years, I plotted on how to do that, and finally I decided I'd just go over to his house and try to get him to come back to work. So I went to see him, and Joan was with him, and I laid out this wonderful opportunity for him and offered him quite a large sum of money, and I said, well, I know the money doesn't really matter, at which point Joan spoke up and said, who says that? <laughs> he came. Now Joe had many different duties in our company and he was in charge of corporate affairs and that today the Me Too movement would get you for corporate affairs but we uh, <laughs> y'all were really slow. Anyhow, the, uh, anyhow we had a great organization and we were always doing things and at that particular time Joe was very instrumental in helping us get our first uh, community development corporation. We were the first bank in the country to get one. And he, he hired Dennis Rash, and we began going to work on all of, the, all of that. And so we were also trying to build a city. And of course, while we valued other people's opinion, it, we, it really wasn't highly. We really, <laughs> we really liked one thing. So Joe, in his inimitable fashion, goes to the mayor, who was then Ken Harris, and gets Ken Harris to form a new corporation called the Charlotte Uptown Development Corporation, and to name me chairman of it, and have it be in just two narrow streets, church and, well, maybe it was church and college and, and, and triumph, and uh, we put a special tax on to give us money to operate with, and Joe did all of that, just out of whole cloth. I mean, all of a sudden, we have the Charlotte Uptown Development Corporation. If you read about it now, I think the guy that runs it makes somewhere around a half a million dollars or more, <laughs> and they have brought billions of dollars to this city over the years. But Joe Martin was really the father of that, and uh, I just thought I'd mention that. And of course, I liked it because I got to run the thing. And <laughs> I got to run the town, which I liked, <laughs> and I didn't have to get elected. Uh, now, along the way, we had a number of different things going on, and it, it won't surprise you to know that we were concerned about our public schools, and that we felt like it got in the way in recruiting and what have you, so we all had a lot of opinions about it. So finally I said to Joe, what you need to do is get on the school board. So we ran Joe for school board, and of course he won. And he got on the school board. And while Joe was never famous for his financial capability, he came to me one day and said, I can't take it anymore. He said, we, on the, we have a school board that has gotten a $50 million bond issue passed to build schools with him and they don't have a plan about which school they're going to build or where. He said, I can't take it. And so he left the school. <laughs> that was the only time I've ever seen Joe quit anything. He just couldn't take it. Anyway, we went through a lot of things together, and uh, one of his jobs, uh, and, and maybe he had help with this, a lot of them are here today that were working in, uh, in public, public affairs and trying to build images. I had had a very bad 1987, went, and I had uh, said a lot of things publicly that caused a lot of problems. And, uh, and one of them I said after a seven hour interview, the only quote I got out of it was on South, us doing business in South Africa, and I apparently said that apartheid had never killed anyone. And that was the only quote out of a seven hour interview. And uh, of course, I got drawn and quartered. So Joe decides he's gonna do something about that. 
And so in the 1988 annual report, which came out in January or February in those days, um, he, I'm holding an infant. He's got me beside a family that's got two twins, and I'm holding an infant. And he positioned me so well in the world of children that I had my picture taken. I was on national magazines with a lot of children around me. And truthfully, I don't remember the award I got, but it was sort of like Mother of the Year. <laughs> anyway, that's what Joe did for me in those days. Now along the way, we ran into some of the same issues we're talking about today. We were talking about racial relationships that were very important. And Joe really started something called Race Day. And on every Thursday, you were supposed to go have lunch with somebody from a different race. And we did that quite a bit, but what it showed to us is we didn't know many black people, and we had to work hard to get uh, find somebody to have lunch with. And um, I'm sure that there were a number of very prominent young uh, black men that wondered, why are these people bothering me? It's like <laughs> they, uh, but anyway, it was a great idea then, it's a great idea today, and I think we ought to go back to race day. <laughs> now, Joe did many things for us, and, and he worked a lot on mergers and in, in training in, the, in, in that area and helping us do acquisitions, and, and I guess there are two of them that really stick in my mind, and, one of them, of course, was Texas, and uh, we had gone to Texas, and we, Joe was really, along with Mark Leggett, would go do a lot of the political work that had to be done to try to get people to think we were okay guys, and it'd be all right if we were in that state. And <laughs> so we had gone to Texas, and, and uh, got pretty much home the whole state. And um, <laughs> Joe was down, I had sent Joe down, that, that, down there with my chief of staff, Vic Phillips, to explore the town of Callan, Texas, because it sits on a border with Mexico. And I told Joe that there were, there were tons of money from Mexico and South America coming across the border into Texas and being deposited in little banks in McAllen. I wanted them to scout the town and look for the little bank we could buy and just so we could capture the money that was pouring into the U.S. We wouldn't change the name, we were just going to let them keep operating and gather all that wealth. So I also told them they should go across the border and have dinner in Mexico while he was there. Well, when they returned, they briefed me. And at the end, they shared with me one of the facts, that when they did go over to Mexico for dinner, they were scared to death when they were trying to get back. They said they came, they came out of the restaurant, and it was pitch dark, and they didn't really remember exactly how they got there. <laughs> didn't know where the border was, and they saw shadowy figures lurking in doorways of the buildings that passed, watching them drive by. They only made it back because the border checkpoint is so brilliantly lit that they could see the direction they needed to go. <laughs> now, when he, when he finished telling me the story, I, I said, you two drove into Mexico by yourself? Are you crazy? <laughs> and Joe replied, well, you told us to go off a dump and, and that you had done it. I said, yeah, but I went with four, four bodyguards and a trunk full of ammunition. <laughs> so, that just proves that a PhD can be brilliant on some topics and dumb as a rock on others. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but the real story I want to tell is about the Martin Group. We, we had found a loophole to get into Florida, and we were, had decided we'd go by the Florida National Bank. And so we decided to set up headquarters in, in Jacksonville, but we didn't want anybody to know we were there. And so we created something called the Martin Group. And we rented really the top two floors of this hotel right in downtown uh, Jacksonville. And um, we, we moved into this area, and there we plotted and, and trained to take over this bank. And I would, I would every day go and negotiate with their lawyers, and the rest of the day we'd spend plotting. And, but one day I'm in a meeting with their lawyer, Fred Kent, Florida National Lawyer, and I realized I needed to ask Joe a question about something that we need, maybe that had to do with the negotiation I was going on. So I call the hotel, and I say, I'd like to speak to Mr. Joe Martin. There was this long silence. And he said, we got a Martin in 2218, 
2215, but ain't none of them got no first name. So, that was my introduction from outside to the Martin Group. But anyway, we were going to pay cash everywhere we went so that we wouldn't uh, leave a trail with our credit cards or anything. So Joe was in charge of the cash. He was in charge of paying everybody. And so he did. He, he, he faithfully paid every bill that came up, no matter what it was. And he was worried about having enough money. And I said, oh, don't worry about that. Just bring a lot of money. So he did bring a lot of money. And so Joe hides $10,000 underneath the floorboard uh, mat of the car that he's renting. So, so this goes along, and the deal kind of falls through. We end up buying the Lake City Bank, the rest is history, but we didn't get the floor of the We decided to close up the Martin Group and fly home. Joe, of course, turns in his car. <laughs> Getting on the airplane, he says, oh my God. <laughs> and he races to the telephone, calls the Hertz or whoever it was and says, you know, I just brought a car back. And they said, oh yes, yes, we've got it. He said, no, I, want to I want to rent it again. <laughs> and he said, I don't want it washed. I don't want it cleaned. I don't want anything done to it. And sure enough, he got the car back and the $10,000 was still there. <laughs> There were many things that happened during that time. One of them, I just mentioned this, that during President Clinton's time in the White House, uh, his Department of Labor sued our bank for some equal pay issue, or really I think they accused us of uh, something even worse, but I don't know what it was. But during the process of the suit, the President called me to ask me for a major contribution. And I told him it didn't seem appropriate for him to be asking me for money, or for me to be giving him money in the midst of his Department of Labor suing my bank. The very idea infuriated me. So after the call, I was hot as I could be. I called my secretary, Pat Henson, and Joe into the office. I dictated a flaming hot letter to the president, expressing clearly my feelings about the call. And when I finished, I told Pat to type it up right away because I wanted to fire it off to the White House and so then Pat and Joe left the office. Now I've since learned that Joe, being the brilliant English scholar that he was, told Pat to give him the draft of the letter before giving it to me so that he could check it for grammar and spelling. Didn't want to send the letter to the president with any errors. Pat faithfully honored Joe's request and gave it to him right away. It's now my understanding, and to my surprise, that this letter draft was never seen again, <laughs> never discussed again, and never mailed. So that reinforces that Joe was not only a brilliant scholar, but also a very savvy political technician. <laughs> tactician. So I have to go then to a different era, and that is that when Joe first found he had a problem, uh, they went to this doctor who told him he had really 20 months to live. And uh, Joe, being Joe, and Joan was with him, uh, they neither one thought much of the diagnosis of the, uh, really the pro prognostication, and so much so that on the way out of the door, uh, Joan told this man what she thought oh, no. his IQ was <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, what, um, how many times he would ever see, had, will ever see her, and that was with an, an Italian salute. <laughs> As you know, uh, he went on to get a much better diagnosis and outlived that one as well. Now, I want to switch gears just a minute and talk about all the things Joe did after getting ALS. And the first one that comes to mind is I'm out in my yard and all of a sudden around the curve by my house comes a, a, a vehicle. I don't know exactly what to call it. It was like a, 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 a horizontal bike. And on it, is Joe. He comes squealing into my yard 
and he's even though he can't walk, he's on a bike that he can pedal, and he's got a he's bleeding from the head, even though he's got a helmet on. <laughs> and I learned that he has turned over on the big curve coming down from Biltmore, and but the jogger had helped him back onto the uh, bike, and so. Today, I'm 84, so I can't remember how he got home. I don't know whether he pedaled back up that hill. He might have. I don't, I don't really know. But anyway, that was my first really encounter with Joe uh, after we had talked in the office. But he, he did a lot of interesting things. But he, we had something happen in our city. And we had a play come called Angels in America, and the chair, our I think it was our county commissioners decided to do all to ban it and to take off, take money away from all the arts groups and whatever. So Joe, who by this time is using his electronic speaker, goes with a whole bunch of us. We we, we had everybody in the city, I think, go to the meeting, and Joe spoke. And if y'all will indulge me, I would like to read what he said at the Board of County Commissioners on April the first. 1997, and I'm tempted to send this to the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you'll indulge me, I will be going to read this. My name is Joe Martin. Whatever else you may know about me, think of me as a pres Presbyterian elder. It is that office that compels me to be here. Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you any catechism questions, but it would be fun to see how well you biblical scholars handle the question of, quote, what is man's chief end? But I have a different question for you. What in the name of heaven are you doing to this town? This debate is not about the arts, is it? This is about something more fundamental. This is about the power of government and how some people can use it against others. When you get through using it to remove homosexuals from art, will that be all? Or will you also remove them from the public library, require them to carry identity cards, or wear a scarlet leather, prevent them from doing business with the county? Do you plan to stop providing police protection for them? And who do you plan to go after next? Black Muslims, maybe? Your interpretation of the Bible is not kind to them either. And they are certainly not your idea of the traditional American family. You could maybe get away with shoving them off the face of the earth. And how far down your list are Dilworth and Plaza Midwood, since you think they are bohemian and not traditional American neighborhoods? Am I in trouble with you because I go to church in Dilworth with some of those very people? Will I need an identity card with your approval to get to my church? Come to think of it, how do you feel about Presbyterians in general? <laughs> Since I categorically reject, reject, deny, and abhor your government's interpretation of the Bible, you better have a plan for coming after me, or is this in fact the beginning of that plan? Ironically, I actually am that traditional American family you say you're promoting. So hear me. When one group of people uses the power of the government to impose personal biases or religious beliefs on other people who are not doing anything illegal, the government itself becomes the most dangerous threat to traditional American values. And the time to stand up to that government is not when they come for me, but when they go after the first of my neighbors that they perceive to be politically weak. I confess, I am afraid of you. We've been down this path with governments of moral arrogance before. One burned us out of our thatched roof cottages because we chose not to worship their king or their Bible. Another burned our bodies in the state because our religious beliefs were in conflict with their interpretation of the Bible. And we formed a government that allowed us to burn the skin of human beings with hot branding irons to show that they were our property. And our government found justification for that in the Bible. Ah, you say. But we're not really shoving anybody off the face of the earth or burning anybody at the stake. We're just changing the way we fund the arts. I'm not that stupid. What have you said? What you have said is the Constitution won't let us arrest these people, so let's go outside the law and burn a few crosses on the lawns of their sympathizers. Take a deep breath, so deep you can smell history. 
There's a stench in this government chamber, isn't there? And it is centuries old. It is the smell of burning fats in Scotland. It is the smell of burning flesh in France and in Germany in this century. It is the smell of burning books in Boston. It is the smell of burning branding irons in Charleston. It is the smell of burning crosses in Charlotte. It is the smell of government rotting in its abuse of its power, all in the name of religion. A German Lutheran whose faith was different from yours and led him to stand against his government said, when they come for the Jews, I said nothing because I am not a Jew. When they came for the Catholics, and I said nothing because I am not a Catholic. When they came for me, I cried out for help, but there was no one left to hear my cry. Now, when the word goes out in the dark night that they've come for the gays, what do you think the people will do? Will they close their shutters and turn out the lights and hold up the sign that says, it's okay, I'm not gay? Or will they come out and light candles in the darkness and join hands with their neighbors and stare this government down, telling you to back off? Hear me, if you stand for the most basic of American values, for freedom from illegal and arbitrary government power, say no to this proposal. That was Joe Martin after he had ALS. read another thing that he did and that is the idea of facing the disease and here's what he had to say about when Kevorkian was um, was uh, offering to help people uh, out quickly kill themselves that who had this disease and he says I understood, I understood why some friends with ALS have called it quits and elected not to recover. My moments of real hopelessness, hopelessness are so rare because I have such support all around me, but my worst moments are standard everyday experience for other people. It's good for me to get a whiff of what they go through, and I don't want to forget how they must feel all the time. Now, in the bottom of the pit, two things keep coming to mind. One was something Billy Wyman said in the, cl cl closest, in, in the closest thing to performance appraisal he ever gave me, and I quote, Well, you're not a quitter, Martin. You can be a real shit, you know that. <laughs> but you're not a quitter. End of quote. So this all sounds too dramatic, dramatic, and I am in good shape this week. Have to re but I have to rebuild my weight and stamina after being sick. So then he later wrote this, or said this, while we are learning together, no, excuse me, what we are learning together is that it is possible to live a full, active, satisfying life despite being given a death notice. And now despite severe paralysis, it is possible to recover with an incurable disease. It is possible to recover life and to remain or become fully engaged in life. What's required is a communal will to live fully and faithfully, day after day after day. Call, call it common life expectancy. It isn't always easy. Sometimes life expectancy, expectancy has to be created fresh every morning and applied to the day at hand. As a community, we do that for each other. We've been given the power to create boundless life expectancy, no matter what circumstances any of us may have to face. It's what makes us a community. In God's own time, death will come. Until then, don't give up on God's possibilities for your life. It isn't the length of our life expectancy, but it's the strength that makes a difference. And so, as I come to the end of my comments, I want to read from the 
what the observer had to say on our page after Joy died. He was a man of rare intellect, compassion, and courage. Our community has been blessed by his presence. Thank you. Thank you.